Welcome back to my channel or if you have not been here before then welcome and uh, this is an experimental video because I wanted to explore something which was on my mind for quite a while and which I think could be a feature to be implemented in future generations of the iPhone. The background is the following. Modern DSLMs, in particular in the professional lineup like the Leica SL2 or the Sony A7 series or Panasonic cameras as well as Fuji cameras, even in medium format like the Fuji GFX100 or the new 100S. And to mention some more examples, of course, the Canon EOS R5 or the Nikon C7 Mark II they all have in-body image stabilization, which is based on a sensor floating in a magnetic field and in this way adjusting for movements of the camera to keep the sensor stable and avoid blurriness from tiny little shakes. In some of these cameras, sensor shift is also used for pixel shift and pixel shift is then used for creating multi-shots where the sensor in a series of frames is shifted by half a pixel or one pixel in different directions and then later in camera or in post by dedicated software, these various frames can be stacked together to create a multi-resolution image, which is multiple times the resolution of what the sensor in the camera natively can shoot. Now, what has all of this to do with the iPhone? Well, in the iPhone 12 Pro Max, Apple introduced for the very first time sensor shift technology for in-body image stabilization on that all new sensor, as you see here on display in another video I made on the iPhone 12 Pro Max. And sensor shift works in the iPhone absolutely flawless. You can go for longer exposures, handhold without using a tripod and it's clearly also used for the very famous night mode and all kinds of features of the Apple iPhones. The question I'm going to explore in detail in this video is, so far Apple has used the sensor shift technology in the iPhone 12 Pro Max for in-body image stabilization, but they do not use it yet for pixel shift and multi-shot to lift up the native resolution of the iPhone sensor with 12 megapixels to something like 48 megapixels. It's remarkable that Apple has the technology ready and available in the iPhone, but does not leverage it for a multi-shot feature, despite the fact that they are big in computational photography, like in the night mode on the iPhone, in deep fusion, and all these technologies which already leverage algorithms and stacking several frames to achieve better overall results in photography. So the question is, when will we see a multi-shot feature in the iPhone 12 Pro Max and its potential successors in the course of the year? What I'm going to do now is I will provide a so-called proof of concept that pixel shift leading to a multi-shot feature would actually work on the iPhone 12 Pro Max. And I'm going to do this manual. I'm going to simulate a pixel shift situation, then I'm going to stack these images in post and will prove that the result is much, much better than the original single shot image natively coming out of the iPhone. As a pre-remark, I've actually done this before, namely on a Leica M10P, but the big difference between a Leica rangefinder and the iPhone 12 Pro Max is that the sensor in the rangefinder in the Leica M10P is fixed mounted and has no sensor shift technology implemented in contrast for instance to the Leica SL2 and the SL2S. On the iPhone 12 Pro Max you actually have sensor shift already implemented and all that is missing is a piece of software which then enables the multi-shot in the way I'm going to demonstrate now in my live experiment. Before shooting in burst mode on the iPhone, make sure that in the settings under camera, you have actually activated use volume up for burst because this enables you to press and hold the volume up button and as long as you keep pushing it, it will take in a very high speed images with the iPhone camera. Here is my scene in Zurich and I take a single shot and then I go into burst via volume up and you see how speedy this is. I can only recommend to use the burst mode for sport and action because it will not fail you and will capture that part of the scene and movement you really want to see. If you found the burst shot in your iPhone camera roll, you can actually go into the selection process and select the frames you want. I'm just choosing here 40 consecutive shots 
and uh, we'll later work with them in post-processing in the course of the video. The manual selection process of frames is a bit tedious, so I'm going to accelerate this now here in the video. And finally, I had my 40 frames in the way I wanted to have them. If you push done, you are asked whether you want to keep everything or keep only the favorites. I decided for everything, deal done. The 40 images are then stored side by side in the iPhone's camera roll. You can select them all in a swipe gesture and then share them to wherever you want to share it. I decided to share it to my MacBook because here is where the post-processing will happen in the course of the video. And you see how it is sending and then the job is done. After opening Photoshop, we go to File and under File we find Scripts and there we find Load Files into Stack. Doing so opens another menu which is called Load Layers. And in this menu, make sure at the bottom, you don't checkbox any of the offerings there. Just go to browse. Then let's find the folder where the 40 frames are stored. And in my case, that's in the folder iPhone multi-shot, then burst shot images. And here I can now select and mark the 40 images and then open them to be imported each image into a single layer. So if I click OK here, the process starts. And then you see in the layer section of Photoshop, how these layers are created and filled with the individual images. That is a longer process, so we need to be a bit patient here and just wait until Photoshop gets the job done. Next we go to image and on image we select image size. And then a submenu opens up again. And here I want to have now three times the horizontal and the vertical dimension in terms of percentage. And Photoshop calculates for us a pixel size of more than 12,000 times more than 9,000 pixels here. On the resample submenu, you have quite a bunch of options here. And clearly here, everyone in the community has her or his own preference. I wanted to go for preserved details and then decided for the newer version, which is preserved details 2.0 which actually work quite well in my case. If I now push OK, the process starts to change the image size to what I specified here in that submenu, and it's applied in homogeneous ways to all images in the 40 layers. Now we need to auto-align the 40 layers, and for this we go again to the layer section and mark the first one, scroll down, hold shift, and click the last one in order to select them all. Once they are all selected, we can go into Edit, and under Edit, we choose Auto Align Layers, which opens another submenu where we don't have to change anything. We leave it as is, push OK, and then the process of auto aligning these 40 layers will start. What comes next is a bit tedious because we now want to blend these layer into each other by approximately equal opacity contributions. We have all in 40 images and one divided by 40 is 2.5%. So we will start with an opacity of 2.5% for layer one, then we go to 5% for layer two, 7.5% for layer three, and so on. When doing this, we find that 2.5% will be rounded up to 3% by Lightroom here in the opacity field. And uh, that is clearly something which we have to accept and it doesn't actually take away the accuracy we need here to work. It's not really playing a role. I nevertheless will fill in 2.5% incremental steps here because if you would have a different number of frames, I want you to actually follow exactly the equally weighted scheme here and go up by exactly that incremental step each time you migrate from one layer to the other. As you can imagine, this procedure takes a while because you have to go for 40 manual steps to actually get the opacity adjusted in the way I just described. And uh, I think I will shortcut this here now and just show you the final result with the opacity adjusted layers. When the manual work is done, we have our 40 layers here and the opacity is now going from 3% to 5 to 8 to 10 to 13 to 15% and then to 18 and to 20% and so on because Lightroom was rounding these numbers. And despite this, let's call it a rounding error, we have now approximately equal contributions in terms of opacity from each of the 40 layers to a final image, which we'll create in a moment. Here you see the final checks, 90%, 93, 95, 98, and 100%. So we are now ready to create the final image with these monster pixel dimensions. We saw before when we created the canvas of the final image and prepared for it in Photoshop. 
Before we come to the final image, there is one point I want to make here. And clearly, since these 40 frames are all a little bit shifted forth and back by the shakes of my hand, we have, when we auto line them in Photoshop, these artifacts at the borders of the image. So that later on, I will crop in a tiny little bit into the image to get these artifacts at the borders away. Now let's select layer one. Let's scroll down, let's hold shift and click layer number 40. Let's check that we have selected them all and then right click on the selected layers and go to flatten image. Flattening the 40 layers into one final image should not take overly long. You will see a progress bar again and have to be a little patient, but then Photoshop will get the job done for you. I'm now going to import this multi-resolution or multi-shot image into Lightroom side by side with the single shot and will draw my conclusions about what we just created here. We will now compare the native 12 megapixel shot coming from the iPhone 12 Pro Max, which will always be on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, I will always show the multi-shot image processed in the way shown previously in the video. I also changed the white balance of the images because that bluish color before on the images was not very natural and not reflecting that evening scene in the way I saw it with my naked eyes. A multi-shot option, no matter whether executed manually or in camera body like in many professional DSLMs, always has three effects. First of all, it will reduce noise and grain in the image. Second, it will enhance and better represent details and in this way enable larger prints. And third, if there are moving objects or subjects in your scene, they will be represented by some ghosting effect. Here is the first deep crop into the two images and you already get here a first impression about that ghosting effect. And looking at the left hand side in the single shot, you see the group of people sharp and clearly represented, whereas on the right hand side, you see that ghosting going on because these people will have moved and uh, you know will be differently represented in the 40 frames we did in the multi-shot. That is normal and also happens of course in any other camera, no matter how professional it is, if you go for a multi-shot. Looking into another deep crop, it's clear that on the right hand side in the multi-shot we have noise reduced and we have a much better representation of details. I don't know how well this is visible if you watch this video on an iPhone, but if you watch it on a TV or if you would watch it on a computer, you would clearly see the difference is absolutely significant and gives you much more reserves for cropping into the image or if you wanted to go for it, to print it in large dimensions. Here's another deep crop into a different part of the scene. If you look at the car, for instance, clearly, better details on the right hand side in the multi-shot and less noise and grain and the same applies to the ceiling in the foreground. Again, I think is very significant the difference here between the two images. Same observation on another part of the scene. Again, look at the car and the number plate and compare the right hand side taken with the multi-shot with the native 12 megapixel on the left hand side. Much better on the right hand side and if we crop in even deeper, I think the difference might be even visible if you watch this video on an iPhone or smartphone. You clearly see in the car window on the right hand side in the multi-shot how the multi-shot technique reduced noise and grain in the window and how much noise and grain you have if you crop in that deeply. Remember how big that overall scene was into the image and clearly the 12 megapixel on the left hand side, they produce here a lot of noise and grain. But also if you look at the number plate, a much better, much clearer representation in the multi-shot on the right hand side than what you get on the left hand side in the native iPhone sensor resolution. The same applies to any other structures like in the walls of the church here and the church windows. I'll zoom in a little bit now in the video, which will probably create some additional noise, but just to give you the impression. And despite the fact that it stresses, of course, the video resolution here, you clearly see the difference between native 12 megapixel on the left hand side and multi-shot 108 megapixel on the right hand side. Details are still captured well on the multi-shot side, but with much less noise and grain in the structure of the walls. I think in this scene, which shows a rooftop part of the overall image, 
it becomes even more eye-catching how much more detail and clarity you get in the multi-shot on the right hand side and how much noise and grain and loss of detail and clarity you have on the left hand side on the native 12 megapixel resolution as they come out of the iPhone. And this is not a criticism on the iPhone. That crop I was doing here is just too deeply into the image for 12 megapixels, whereas on 108 megapixels I can of course do it. Cropping even deeper into that statue in the foreground of the image, you see if I now smoothly zoom into my video here that you get pixel block building on the left hand side on the 12 megapixel side whereas the right hand side in the multi shot is still smooth and shows no pixel artifacts. Last example here same story right hand side smooth clear representation of details no noise and grain left hand side as is if you crop that deeply into a 12 megapixel image. I hope my little experiment is a convincing proof of concept that a multi-shot would actually make a lot of sense on the new iPhone which is about to come this year or as a firmware update on the iPhone 12 Pro Max because it already has sensor shift implemented for all kinds of computational photography hacks but not yet for a multi-shot feature. I could imagine that they would never go for 40 frames and for 108 megapixels but maybe they would go for 16 to 20 frames would lift up the 12 megapixel to 48 megapixel which is a heavy lift already and then working much more precise by embedded algorithms in the camera firmware of the iPhone would very likely also produce much better results than what I did here in my manual workflow and in this way provide a nice future feature for the iPhone 12 Pro Max and later generations of the iPhone. If you liked that video, don't forget to drop me a thumbs up. Thanks for watching, stay safe and healthy and of course, peace out.